Hello, it's Scott Manley here, reunited with all my knickknacks, including my 3D printed Kerbals and my mug signed by Miguel Alcubierre and also a sonic screwdriver in there. Yeah, I'm a nerd, I know. But I want to talk about neutron stars and specifically I want to talk about the group that claims to have discovered the heaviest neutron star yet. And this isn't just a case of our neutron star is bigger than yours because the thing about neutron stars is there is an absolute upper limit of how massive they can get. It's called the Tolman oppenheimer volkov limit. And this is kind of a, a magic point at which uh, beyond this mass the neutron star will collapse into a black hole. There are three, more or less three end states that you get for collapsed stars. You get the white dwarfs, which are sort of the lower mass end of the spectrum. Neutron stars are what happens when things get heavier and black hole are like everything from that point out. So this particular neutron star is in a binary system. It is a, uh, with a white dwarf. The neutron star is spinning extremely rapidly, something like 346 times per second. And in fact, if you look at the paper, they know this speed extremely accurately to like 10 decimal places. And as it spins, it emits chirps of radio waves, right? Because the magnetic pole whips around and these, uh, this spinning thing generates these pulses and they come to Earth very, very regularly. This is a millisecond pulsar and the timing is perfect but it's in a system with a white dwarf. Now the white dwarf, the mass is estimated to be about uh, 0.26 solar masses. Uh, the two objects orbit every few days and the distance between them is 3.977 light seconds. So they're pretty close and they're also exactly in the same plane as uh, the Earth. So when we look at it, we see this system edge on, and that means that neutron star passes in front of the white dwarf, and then it passes behind the white dwarf. Actually, I've got this wrong because I get this, you get this idea that a star system has the big star in the middle, the biggest thing is in the middle, and the small planets are around the outside. That's the wrong image here because the neutron star is so much heavier. It's the small, tiny thing in the middle, and the the, the white dwarf is you near know, 12, 15,000 kilometers across. So it's like a thousand times the size of that neutron star and it's orbiting around it. Anyway, whenever the white dwarf passes in front of the neutron star, it uh, blocks off the radio waves and the radio pulses actually, some of them get bent around by the white dwarf's gravity. And this means they can in fact still reach the earth thanks to the gravity of this star. But to do that, it means they actually have to take a slightly longer, more circuitous route to get here. And that actually results in them slowing down, taking slightly longer. When the white dwarf is in the way, the pulses are delayed by about 10 microseconds. So by monitoring the pulsar in, you know, with great precision, they can actually measure this delay and therefore measure the mass of that white dwarf. And that white dwarf is 0.26 solar masses. Because they know the uh, frequency of these pulses, they can also get the exact velocity uh, of the neutron star in this star system. So knowing the mass of the white dwarf, knowing the uh, motion of that neutron star, you can actually then extrapolate or derive the mass of that neutron star to be 2.14 solar masses. That's a really cool number. In fact, it's a really high number. Uh, recently, there was a LIGO observation, a gravity wave observation that showed two compact bodies coming together in a death spiral and combining to form a larger body, which was estimated to be 2.17 solar masses and it collapsed into a black hole. So that would suggest that the neutron mass limit is below 2.17. This now suggests that it's above 2.14. We're getting very close together to converging on an answer here. So that's important because there's many different kinds of neutron star models and some of them can't actually support these high mass objects. So as I said, these, these uh, compact objects, they're held up by something called degeneracy pressure. Essentially, in a normal gas, 
you've got uh, particles bouncing around and they bounce off the walls and as they bounce off the walls you know momentum transfer and that keeps it up and as the stuff heats up then it expands or well, the pressure increases now as it starts to collapse it doesn't get hot anymore you get the electrons or sort of the atoms get squished down closer and closer together and that means the electron clouds get smaller and smaller and the spaces that electrons have to occupy in these uh, orbitals around the atoms get smaller and smaller and because of quantum mechanics if you put something in a box it's not just a particle it's a wave function and the wave has to fit in this box and that means the wavelength can't be bigger than the box and if you put things to shorter and shorter wavelengths, say like photons, right? As you shrink the photon wavelength, the photon energy gets higher. So as you shrink the box that the electron is in, its energy gets higher and higher. And that actually means that as you shrink it down, it produces this extra pressure from this uh, lowest possible energy state. That's the sort of rough lies to children version. There's way more accurate way of doing this. Now, with white dwarfs, what eventually happens is the electrons start to go relativistic. So instead of getting faster and faster, they start putting more and more energy into basically not going any faster because they can't go faster than the speed of light. So at a point, this stops providing pressure that could offset the increase in gravity and the thing is unstable. Now with white dwarfs, if you take like a you know 1.4 mass solar a white solar mass white dwarf and add mass to it, then eventually it actually explodes because it sort of begins to collapse, but then that just gives the carbon and the oxygen inside it the chance to finally undergo nuclear fusion. And they do it in a matter of a fraction of a second. The whole thing just annihilates itself. So you don't actually get a white dwarf and turn it into a neutron star. But, neutron stars are formed during supernova. So, in this case, you've got a neutron star at the core of a high-mass star. And the core, essentially, collapses down, the outer layers blow off, and you're left with this much more compact object. The, as I said, the electrons and the protons have combined to form neutrons, and you've got a little neutron in a box, and as you shrink the box down, the neutron goes faster and faster, and you know, your Tolman-Oppenheimer-Volkov limit is when things start to go relativistic, more or less. Incidentally, in this system where you have a white dwarf and a neutron star, the way this probably formed is you had a slightly heavier star and a slightly lighter star and of course the slightly heavier star burns through its fuel faster and it puffs up into a red giant and then this slightly lower mass star well it's still minding its business on its own business on the main sequence it starts sucking all the matter off of this uh, big heavy star and in fact what it sucks away it just leaves the core behind in this case maybe a quarter solar mass degenerate core that collapses down and forms the white dwarf whereas this star now actually goes through a much more accelerated aging it generates a supernova and becomes a white uh, sorry a neutron star so that neutron star that is now four times sorry wait a second eight times the mass of that white dwarf was originally less mass than that star that's one possible way that's the most likely way this happened so yeah, um, knowing this limit about the way the neutrons in the box behave leads us to interesting uh, situations because there are all sorts of alternate ways to model what happens when you get when the pressures start to reach the limits of what neutrons can handle. They, some say that when you squeeze the neutrons down, the individual quarks inside them become important. In fact, some suggest that they become decoupled into a sort of quark gluon plasma and they start to flow around freely. And this actually changes the stiffness of what a neutron star would be and it changes where the upper mass limit is. Well, now you know that it's above this limit, it actually starts to make that theory look like it may not be possible. There are other theories that use, or other uh, approaches that produce things like uh, Einstein-Bose meson condensates, and that probably doesn't work either. There are things called hyperons. See, neutron stars are these incredibly dense, incredibly high energy, you know, seas of nuclear material. On Earth, we can't produce them. 
on Earth, what we do is we take nuclei and we smash the nuclei into each other in particle accelerators and we create a tiny, tiny approximation of that for a tiny, tiny amount of time. Whereas neutron stars are just entire stars made of stuff in this state. So if we can figure out exactly where these things, how, what these things do when they get to this mass limit, it tells you about the forces that make nuclei work. It lets us know, you know more about the material that makes us up by looking at the material that made that star up. So yeah, that's why this is interesting. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.